missionary aviation. And Quinn is all about that from what I've read in the email exchanges we've had. And so, Quinn, Lord bless you, brother. And uh, we look forward to having you uh, present your work to us this morning. Uh, if you have questions, kind of take note of them. And if there's time at the end, we will have time for questions. And, and Quinn will give you some answers. So, welcome. Lord bless you. Thank you very much. Well, I know what all of you are probably thinking. When they called the boys and girls, I probably should have went downstairs. Uh, pretty, pretty young. Um, let's see how this thing works here. Oh, here we go. We'll turn it on. He saw me. Perfect. Yeah, so just so I don't speak uh, something you already know, how many of you here have heard about JARS specifically? Oh, great. Great. Okay, okay. Um, so we are a jungle aviation relay service, and uh, I'm going to take some time and tell you all about that, tell you a little bit about me. But before we do that, um, I wanted us to turn to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, we're going to go verse, uh, thir verse 4 through 30. And just look at the way uh, Jesus calls us. That's what I want to talk about this morning is the way Jesus calls us. If you look... John chapter 4, verse 4, it says, and I thank you, uh, brother, for reading this earlier. Um, it says, and he had to pass through Samaria, so he came to the town of Samaria called Sychar, near that field, near the field that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. It's about 12 o'clock, and what we see here is Jesus, Jesus is strategically positioned. And I want to I outline, uh, the, this is the way Jesus calls people. This is the way Jesus called this, this woman at the well. And the first thing we see is that Jesus is strategi strategically positioned. He didn't have to go through Samaria. You might know that um, a lot of times Jews would, would not go through Samaria because they uh, were not friendly with the Samaritans. The Samaritans were not friendly with them, so they would make trips around Samaria, but Jesus strategically decided to go through Samaria. Why? Let's keep reading. Verse 7, a woman from Samaria came to, came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So we see Jesus was strategically positioned to do what? To meet a very specific person, of a woman of all people. In a time where, when women weren't valued as much as they should be. And Jesus goes and not only meets a woman in Samaria, but an outcast um, a woman who, um, who you will see has kind of a rough past, a woman who, who has had a lot of hurt, um, a woman who's, who's been struggling. And I don't, I don't know how known or not known she was, but I imagine her goal in life was just to kind of go unnoticed. Um, she's there at the well when no one else would have been there in the middle of the day when it's hot. And uh, she's trying to just make it through life. Um, and we see if we continue reading in verse 10, it says, it says, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give to you living water. And the woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw the water with. And the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank, drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks the water, drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I might not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. And Jesus said, Yes, and Jesus said to her, go, call your husband, and come here. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you're right in saying you have no husband. For you've had five husbands, and the woman you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. 
And the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor on Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You will worship you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation has come from the Jews. But an hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must must worship in spirit and truth. And the woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming. He was called the Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I, who you speak to, am he. So we see that Jesus is strategically positioned to meet a specific person to do what? to reveal himself, to, to change her perspective, to say, hey, hey, you think you need this water. I've got water that's even better. Let me change your perspective. And let me show you that, the, that your problem that you think you have isn't actually your deepest problem. Your problem is you need living water, and I'm the answer. I'm, I want to show you myself. And then what does he do? Keep looking. In verse 27, he says, it says, just then his disciples came back and they marveled at what he, at what he was talking, that he was talking to a woman, but no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into the town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? So Jesus was strategically positioned to meet a specific person to reveal himself to redeem her story. And I, this is probably one of the most profound things um, that jumped out to me in this passage is the fact that she came with a story that carried a bunch of shame, and then she left with that same story that carried hope because Jesus was inserted. She walked away talking about Jesus seeing her whole story, all of her struggle, all of of her mistakes, and all all of her rough past, and Jesus turns that into hope, inserts himself as the living water, and as the Messiah. And now she takes that same story and says, look who saw me and still accepted me. Look who, look who saw all the things that were tough in my life and still wanted me. And then, she do, and then Jesus does one more thing in verse 30, the very last verse we'll look at today. And it says, they went out to the town, these people that she was talking to, and were coming to him. So Jesus, Jesus was strategically positioned to meet a specific person, to reveal himself redeem her story, and to give her a role in the building up of the kingdom. And this is actually the very first time Jesus, this is when Jesus starts his public ministry. So he gives her an incredible role, a role that's one of the most, possibly one of the most important ones, uh, one of the most important roles in his ministry, because he says, I want you to start this thing. You, a woman, you, an outcast, you, an enemy of my people, I say, hey, come into my family. Drink of my water. I will redeem your story. And this this is how Jesus calls us. This is how Jesus called her. This is how Jesus calls each of us. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background about my story. There's not much background to tell. Um, But it it might help because this this is how the Lord called me. Um, I, I always thought I was going to be in full-time ministry. Um, I don't know if you all can see. But um, I always thought I was going to be in full-time ministry. When I was in high school, I was constantly leading worship. I was always up um, learn, trying to learn how to speak. I just felt the Lord pulling me towards ministry. And then when I was in college, I was, I was on a traveling uh, worship team, and I was going all around the southeast, and I was leading worship. And, um, and then the Lord really gripped my heart for unreached people groups, people that had, had absolutely zero chance of ever hearing the gospel. I remember I was sitting at church or at, at work and I was working, I was listening to a sermon and a pastor by the name of David Platt was, was uh, I was listening to one of his, his sermons on YouTube and it was probably 10 years old, the YouTube video was. And I was just listening, just doing my thing and all of a sudden I hear him say, he goes, I'm, he's talking about unreached people groups. He's talking about people that don't get the opportunity to see, to hear Jesus. And he said, I'm not saying this for you, speaking to the crowd that was there when he was live recording that. But he said, I'm saying this for the college student that years from now will listen to this message and realize that he's being called 
to take up the mantle and, and do what God's called him to do, to go to these unreached people groups to finish um, the task of spreading the gospel to all creation. Um, so that's where I thought I was going. That's what I was pumped about. That's what I was geared up for. Um, but when I graduated college, I graduated with a marketing degree, and uh, I needed a job. And so ended up kind of in a, kind of a, what I would call just kind of a left turn. I didn't, it wasn't expecting it, but it ended up in business aviation, um, which is, we were in, it was a basic private, private jet sales. That's what we were in. I was doing marketing for private jet sales, which is so cool. And it was, it was so fun. I was very grateful to be a part of it, but it, it felt like I was off course. I was like, God, I thought I was going to be in ministry. I didn't, I don't want to be, you know, hobnobbing with, with rich people. I, I want to be, you know, talking to, I want to be going to the ends of the earth. Why I'm over here? And, and what is aviation about? It has nothing to do with my life. I, I, I liked aviation. I always thought it was cool, but I'm like, I, I play piano. <laughs> you know, <laughs> nobody wants a right brain guy in the, in the front seat of a, of a cockpit. You don't want a, p- a creative pilot, let me tell you. Uh, but I was sitting there, and I'm, and I'm, God's just pushing me, stretching me, and um, our office in where we were selling business jets, was uh, it was at an airport, and all day, I'm um, sitting there, and I'm just hearing these planes take off all day, and I'm just like, man, that is pretty cool, that is, that's, that's really cool, and I, I th- I'm sitting there thinking, and I know there's a flight school right beside me, and I'm um, in a spot where I'm like, this might, I don't know, I thought, well, if I learn how to fly, first, um, it'll help me with my current job, because I'll learn I'll be a better aviator. Maybe people, will, I could do this job better. God just want to do the job that you've given to me better. And second, you know, maybe it'll help me get dates. I, I don't know. <laughs> that could help. And then third, you know, I uh, maybe way down the road, I'll use it in ministry. I mean, I've heard of people that, you know, do missionary aviation. Maybe it could help me someday. Um, so went, went next door. Uh, signed up, said, teach me how to fly. Let's see how quickly we can do it. They tried to beat the creativity out of me, put some checklists in my hand, make sure I was safe. And before I knew it, I was a private pilot. And I thought that was pretty cool. It's like, that's, that's amazing. But God, I'm still, I'm off track here, right? You said unreached people groups. You were so clear to me. I, I'm trying to, I was, I want to use music. I want to use ministry. I want to use, uh, I want to use speaking opportunities. I want to be in a full-time ministry in the church. Some positions opened up at different churches and all those doors just got shut. And I'm like, God, you called me to this. It was so clear what's going on. So then about nine months ago, um, my uncle, he was the, a board member in an organization called JARS. And he says, hey, I didn't know you were interested in, in ministry. And I was like, Oh, yeah. He's like, missions, right? Yeah. Unreached people groups, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Hey, we're getting a new president. Why don't you come and meet the president? Maybe you can volunteer in some way. And I'd heard, he told me a little bit about JARS. I'd learned that they're, they're pretty high on experience and wisdom and low on energy and youth a little bit. <laughs> and I thought, hmm, maybe I can come and, you know, be a kid, you know, get, bring the kid's perspective. You got to get new recruits. And so I, I showed up. And before I knew it, I was find myself sitting down with the, with this new president um, and the senior leader team. And he looks at me and he's like, well, uh, if we can get you here, we want you here. And I said, I don't know what that means. He said, well, I'd, uh, I'd like to give you a seat at the table. And I still don't know what that means. And my uncle, actually, who was sitting there, leads over to me. He goes, he wants, he wants you to be on the executive team with him. And I was like, sir, I don't know how to be an executive. And he goes, I know. I'll teach you. How else are you going to learn? And I said, Okay, good point. Uh, I'll go, what are you thinking about doing? What do you want me to do? He goes, I'm thinking vice president of future operations and marketing. And I was like, I don't think I know how to do that, but I will give it my best shot. As I leave, this is just a slight little tidbit you'll find interesting. As I leave, he slides a book across the table to me, and I pick it up, and it says, we got him. It's the hunt and, and capture of Saddam Hussein. And I said, and the author was Steve Russell, this man's name, who's going to be my boss. And I said, you're the guy who caught him? And he's like, yeah, yeah. And he goes, I'd like to mentor you. I was like, sign me up. Uh, I'd love to learn anything you have to do. And so he uh, is an incredible man, godly man. He, he wanted to give me a seat at the table. And I, all of a sudden, I saw everything kind of come together. Aviation, 
unreached people groups, the marketing thing that he had, had been working in my life, and God's kind of pulling my story together. And I'm realizing that uh, he, uh, God, Jesus was strategically positioned to meet me specifically, to reveal himself in a way I hadn't seen him before, to redeem my story that I thought was a left turn, and to give me a role in building up the kingdom of God, just like the woman at the well. And um, it's, been, it's been absolutely incredible. It's been uh, something that I would have never expected. Um, but I guess the question is, what about JARS? What about Jungle Aviation and Relay Service? Well, I'm Vice President of Future Operations. What does the future look like? I don't have any mission stories yet. Um, working on it. Uh, but I can tell you where, I, where, we're, where JARS is hoping to go. And um, it's really exciting. We want the future of JARS to look just like Jesus. Um, so we want to be strategically positioned. Um, we call this the green band of jungle regions. It's right across the equator. And um, it's where the world's most remote peoples live. Um, and it, it, there's, a, there's a word called unreached people groups out there that means they have no access to the gospel. These people are not only unreached, meaning they, there's no church nearby, but they're also untouched sometimes, undiscovered sometimes. Some of our pilots will look around and they'll see, they'll be flying and then they'll notice some smoke over, uh, over here and they'll look at their chart and there's nothing on the chart. Oh, there's a people group over here that we haven't even, haven't even discovered yet. We, we need to go. And we, being jars, are strategically positioned, strategically equipped to be there. And that's exactly what we want to do, how we want to do it. Um, we already operate in these regions. Um, we provide pilots to seven uh, other organizations that, that operate in country. We, we, we train them, we equip them, and then we send them out, we send them with aircraft, and they go and they serve with their organizations in these jungle regions, but we want to take it to the next step. Those guys are already working in, the, in regions that are established. We want to go to, um, to open up new fields in the northern part of Democratic Republic of Congo, the northeastern part or northwestern part of Papua New Guinea, and Vanuatu, and Solomon Islands. And so what we're thinking is, we're thinking we could set up um, multinational hubs in each one of these regions. And God's already been moving to, to make this happen. Um, we've got partners in Australia um, that said, hey, we've got $5 million worth of assets. We've got bulldozers. We've got, we've got um, four-wheel drives. We've got excavators. We've got all of these, all this equipment, and by the way, we've built a barge, and we want to send it up the Ramu River so we can reach these people in northwest New Guinea, where um, it's a cro basically crocodile cults, and an infant, infant mortality rate of 50%, and um, they're like, why don't you guys just join us, and we, we need air support. Uh, w and it actually, instead of we us joining, uh, you joining us, we'll just join you and become Jars Australia. We said, <laughs> oh, absolutely. So we're, we're looking at possibly moving into that, that area um, in Australia so that we can reach all of Melanesia. Um, this, is a, this is another thing that, that is new to missionary aviation is um, working regionally as opposed to in one specific country. We'd like to, we'd like to basically maximize our assets um, by operating regionally instead of registering them in one specific country. And so, and then if, that, uh, if you're going to look at it in the Congo, this is, if you're looking at sub-Saharan Africa, that's what you're looking at right now. Um, that, m that middle portion right here is the Democratic Republic of Congo, surrounded by Republic of Congo and Central African Republic, South Sudan. We, we've already got some assets set up in the region, but we want to expand to Bandaka, and where you're seeing those top line, those top little dots in um, the Democratic Republic of Congo, that's that's where some of the world's most isolated people are. Yeah, I mean, when you ask other missionary organizations, they say we don't even know what's up there. We just know there's people, and we want to get there. We want we want to open these fields up so that partners that are Bible translators and partners that are church planners, partners that are that are uh, medical missionaries can come and uh, administer these people. We want to create the path. Um, we, so we want to be strategically positioned. And of course, we want to meet very specific people. And I, I want to take this, this opportunity to kind of give you a perspective. I took this photo when I was in Papua New Guinea a few months ago, um, just outside of the plane. And this is beautiful scenery. 
right? It's, it's, I took it because it was beautiful scenery. I'm like, these mountains are insane. I come back to my phone, look at it a little bit closer. And as I zoom in, I realize there's a little village there. It just four little houses, five little houses. And then I looked at some of my other photos. And I'm like, I've just taken pictures. I'm just thinking it's, it's, this is beautiful. And as I looked at little photos, I'm like, there's people up there. And if you notice, there's no roads. And if you notice, there's, there's no landing strip. There's nothing. And then I remembered, Jesus went specifically to a mountain to meet somebody, just one person. And this is what it's all about. This is what we're trying to do. We Jars is strategically positioned to be able to do um, just that, is make it to these places, build these landing strips, um, create access in places where it would never be. We never have access any other way. And I want to tell you about this, just a quick story. Um, when, I was, when I was taking this photo, I was actually in a helicopter on our way to one of our current field operations. And um, this was our helicopter pilot. He was taking us out there. And we, land, we see this village coming up that has been contacted. And um, we land in a soccer field. And these are the precious little images of God that were sitting there waiting for us. And this, this was so beautiful, and I, I was amazed to see them, and they were, they were excited to see us. Um, we were delivering some, some cargo, but I wasn't quite sure what, what we were doing specifically until all of a sudden this lady pops out of the jungle. This lady is a Bible translator that has been there since 1982 by herself, unmarried, in a jungle, strategically positioned, to meet specific people. And, and she stands there as happy as she could be. And I wasn't even thought of in 1982. <laughs> and here I am coming. She's been working since 1982. What's she been working on? A way to reveal Jesus. She's, she's written this language out and has created an alphabet and is now translating that into the Bible. And we're delivering the materials to allow these people to, to read God's word in their own language. And, and it's just, it blows, it blows my mind that I get to be a part of something like this. And it blows my mind that people are doing this. And Jesus is kind of going, yeah, this is what I called you to. This is what we, this is what I want you to do. While we were there, we also realized I could see how Jesus was redeeming these people's stories. This is my friend Barton. He's Papua New Guinean. He's a Bible translator. He, they had been reached. They have been, they, he was a specific pe person that had been, uh, had been reached, had, been, uh, had seen Jesus. His story was redeemed. And now he's been given a role in the kingdom. And now he's even more, because he's just as smart and just as capable and even, even more strategically located and positioned to go reach his own people. And now he's doing Bible translation in country. And we get to come and try to provide some of the transportation needs for them as well. So all in all, Jesus is calling all of us. Jesus is calling me. He's calling you. Um, maybe he's never, maybe you have never been called, maybe you haven't met Jesus before, and I can tell you he's strategically positioned right now today to meet you, to reveal himself, and to redeem your story, to give you a, a, a role in building up the kingdom. But maybe he's already met you. He's continually redeeming your story. I heard someone say one time, there's only really three kinds of Christians. There are avid goers in missions, there are avid senders in missions, and there's the disobedient. And that's all there really is. And it's, it's beautiful to see, hearing, hearing that you guys are already supporting missionaries. I'm preaching to the choir. But Jesus is calling you. He's calling me. He's calling all of us to go and do just, just that, to be strategically positioned to meet specific people, to reveal Jesus so he can redeem their story and he can give them a role in building up the kingdom. And that's really all I have for you. I hope it was encouraging. I hope that um, you could see that God's working all over the globe. He's doing things that we couldn't even imagine. He's using um, pieces of equipment that are just being invented. Um, I imagine the Apostle Paul would have never, ever, um, 
what he would have done to have an airplane. <laughs> he would have been to Spain. He would have made it. Uh, he would have made it to Rome. He would have, he would have done a lot of things. And so um, we're, we're in a time in history where we can do m- way more, exponentially more than we've ever been able to, just, just because of where God's placed us. And uh, maybe I'm just an excited 26-year-old and I've got a lot of energy, or maybe it's actually going to happen. Um, so I thank you so much for allowing me to be here and, um, and share this, this story and kind of share a little bit of what Jars is doing. I'd be happy to answer any questions you guys have, especially when it comes to technology. And um, do, would you like me to pray? Yeah, or yeah, Oh, okay. Perfect. Perfect. Well, I will take a microphone to those who have questions so we can all hear. So yeah, who's yeah. got a question for Quinn? Uh-huh. Oh, okay. Joni. Where are you originally from? Yeah, I'm originally from uh, Kentucky, northern Kentucky. Oh. Yeah, right next to Cincinnati, and then uh, went to school in South Carolina. Are you going to be able to play the piano and sing us a song? <laughs> 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 I can if you want. Sure. But <laughs> I think that's a okay. please do. <laughs> That's so funny. Well, what do you want to hear? <laughs> I, I'm not sure. Whatever's on your heart. Okay. Wow. That was wasn't expecting that. <laughs> Who would have thought? What'd you say? Oh, sorry. I thought I heard you say something. Um. Well. Play. without hope with no place to begin your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested and my life began ash was redeemed only beauty remains my orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began. Until your grace so free washes over me. You have made me begins with you it's your endless love pouring down on us you have made us new now life begins with you release from my chains i'm a prisoner no more Shame was a ransom he faithfully bore. And he canceled my debt, he called me his friend. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace, so free, washes up. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. 
But then Jesus rose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested. My life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made us new now. Life begins with you. Thanks. Amen. Thanks. Thanks for letting me play. I wasn't expecting to do that. That was fun. Amen. <laughs> Part of being a visitor. Yeah. <laughs> he speaks from experience. I'm learning. I'm learning. Any other questions? Or requests, I guess. <laughs> what are your needs right now in the arts? Yeah, you're a great question. So there's a pilot shortage in the world. Um, there's just, in general, uh, huge shortage of pilots. But then also, um, the way we've currently been recruiting has been um, kind of really strenuous for pilots. You know, if you're looking at, there's kind of like three ways for training. You're either going to end up at the airlines, you're going to be, um, or, or business aviation, or you're going to end up um, flying in the military, or you could end up flying in missions. Well, current pilots are looking at, you know, $71,000 starting salary with a $15,000 sounding bonus with American. And, you know, you, when you're looking at becoming an aviator for the military, you, you might get this something very similar, and you might get there quicker. And so a lot of these young guys are saying they're, they're, they're great, they're believers, um, men and women, um, young, young aviators, and they, they want to be a part of, of the mission. And they're looking at our training that's like eight years long, and they're looking at the other alternative where they don't have any debt, and they, or they, as soon as they get done, they can go straight into a, a position where they get, they would get paid um, a lot quicker. And so they say things like, "Well, I'll go to the airlines a little bit, and then I'll come back." Well, by the time they get to the airlines, they've got a couple little ones about ready to go to school, or their, you know, their needs get greater, and we see that they never really come back. Um, God, not that God can't bring them back, but. Our need right now is to bring uh, resources and to uh, solidify some of our recruiting efforts and our messaging efforts to, to consolidate the training to not take so long so we can get them to the field quicker and pay them. Oh. Anticipated the question. I think Bill and Peg. Bill and or Peg. Peg. What's the best way to follow you, like online or something? Yeah. It, Jars.org would be a great way to go. Um, we're getting ready to kind of revamp all, kind of all of our, our marketing and recruiting. Um, so there'll be some changes online. But if you, if you go online and connect and put in your information, um, there'll be a, a ways, ways to serve, ways to give, ways to pray. And um, you could go and put in your information. Those people will get back to you with, uh, with information of, of whatever you're interested in. Um, we got four-wheel drive stuff that we do, we do training with, with that, we provide four-wheel drives, and we also do, we have a maritime effort, and of course, well, we're Evan Aviation efforts, so we'd love to get you connected that way. Time for one more. One more. Woody. Do you plan on putting out a CD so we can get some more of your songs? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I'd like to uh, at some point. Uh, yeah, at some point I, I would like to do that. I don't have a CD right now, but I'd like to be on Spotify and Apple Music at some point. I appreciate that. It's really kind. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. Oh, thank thank you. you for your ministry. Thank you for uh, sharing with us this morning, and, and uh, we want to pray for you. Oh, thank you. Before, before, Thanks for letting uh, me come. Before we go. Yeah. Father, thank you for meeting Quinn exactly where he was at. The, you revealed yourself to him. You revealed... Uh, your plan for him and you met him as a specific person that you redeemed uh, for your purposes and for your work thank you lord for this discipling and mentoring relationship that he is in and lord i pray that much 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 fruit will be born for your kingdom as a result of uh, this one-on-one -on -one relationship that he has uh, with uh, with his boss and lord thank you that they both serve the one who is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So Lord, I pray that you will go before Quinn, that you will uh, reveal to him uh, exactly your plan uh, for the future of JARS and for the people who will hear uh, the gospel as a result of the, uh, the thoughts that are your thoughts that uh, you give to him. So Lord, uh, keep him close to you. Keep him focused on you. Lord, we pray that uh, you will uh, use him in great ways so that when we hear from him again, we'll hear testimony of what you have done and what you are doing. So, Lord, thank you, and uh, we pray your blessings on our brother. In Jesus' name, amen.